and we're live. All right, okay, great. great. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to our third Fight for Your Net Rights Google Hangout on Air. This is part of a series of conversations that we're having with key people involved with the issue of internet freedom, one of the main themes of our film, War for the Web. Uh, joining us today are two of the filmmakers behind the film, uh, Benjamin Caspi, uh, producer, and Michael Wooldridge, who is a writer and producer on the film as well. And our special guest today, uh, Srihari Pandit, President and CEO of Stealth Communications. Um, a little bit about Srihari. He founded Stealth back in 1995, and over the past 10 years, he's developed Stealth into New York City's largest internet gateway. Uh, earlier this year, the organization received an informational uh, franchise and a telecommunications franchise with the city, authorizing the construction and maintenance of its own fiber optic network throughout the city, which is a pretty big deal. And Stealth maintains a number of successful lines of service across the telecom industry, including the voice peering fabric, which is the world's largest marketplace for telephony services. Uh, prior to Stealth, in the early 1990s, Shrihari was a network securities consultant with various companies, including MCI, Sprint, and Sun Microsystems. Uh, Shrihari was also an independent consultant with various U.S. Uh, government agencies, including NASA and the National Infrastructure Protection Center, which is now part of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our filmmakers to talk a little bit about the film. Uh, ben and, and uh, Michael, why don't you go ahead and take it away, and then they'll be asking some questions of Srihari to get this conversation going. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daniel. So, you know, as we've said on previous uh, Hangouts, War for the Web is really the story of the battles going on for control of the Internet today, whether it's through regulation, as we're seeing in coming out of Congress and stuff like that, or if it's through ownership and operation of the of infrastructure, um, as we're seeing in a lot of the big telco spaces nationwide. One of the things that, things that excites us so much about Srihari is that he's uh, operating an independent ISP in a, in a nation full of mostly uh, conglomerate ISPs. And so with that, Srihari, I'd love to ask you, you know, how did you get started uh, offering internet service and, and how did you, what led you to this, this most recent offering in New York City? Sure. Um, so Stealth Communications was started back in 1995 by my wife and I, and we originally uh, got into the business to provide, it was kind of funny, dial-up internet access, and that proved to be a little difficult business to be in because at that time you had AOL and Netcom and these various ISPs competing for you know, dial-up internet, you know, $20 a month basically. So within that year, um, you know, we decided to really kind of exit the dial-up business and focus on uh, business uh, connectivity services. And then that's when we really started succeeding with getting the business off the ground. And it took us, you know, quite a number of years, but, um, you know, obviously during the 2000 time, um, that definitely helped our company kind of get off the ground in a major way by providing connectivity to a lot of the major financial institutions. And, uh, you know, we started providing Ethernet connectivity and primarily um, high-speed Internet access to online uh, brokerage firms so they can do online stock trading. That was a really hot thing. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we started creating other products. Um, we have a, a system called the Big Apple Peer Exchange, which is an internet exchange point here in New York City designed to help content providers and internet service providers exchange traffic, exchange traffic local here in New York City without having to go to Washington, D.C. or Chicago, which are the two other major points of, uh, on the internet where traffic is exchanged. So we run that almost on a cost recovery model um, to help basically keep traffic, again, local in New York City and help um, the local residents and businesses access internet traffic uh, a lot more faster and more reliably. Um, and then the other product that we created was a voice pairing fabric, which is a distributed Ethernet network that allows voice over IP and uh, telephony operators exchange um, basically VoIP traffic among each other without going through the PSTN or the public internet. And so that helps them reduce your operational costs, enables next-gen applications like you know, video calls and stuff like, you know, sip to sip end to end. Um, but so, so anyway, fast forwarding now, um, our real passion was with the business when we started was be able to run our own fiber into commercial buildings, you know, throughout Manhattan to service businesses. Um, and that's always been very difficult to obtain a dark fiber because the availability changes literally almost a week to week, you know, from care to care because it's a very emotional decision for some of them, you know, whether they want to sell it or not sell it. And we can certainly understand that because at the end of the day, we're buying their dark fiber to provide our own internet access instead of them providing it. So that could be viewed as um, competitive. 
And then the second is it was a bit cost prohibitive for, for us to procure it from them, you know, just because of the economics on how they built out their networks. So, um, you know, we've been working on this um, uh, to get our own uh, franchise with the city. And earlier this year, we received an information franchise and a telecommunications franchise that allows us to uh, run up fiber now throughout the city. And that's really exciting because now we don't have to rely on um, other competitive networks and, uh, and companies um, to provision our own services so we can control it end to end and be able to create you know, our own product offering at very economical rates. Oh, very cool. And, and how, I guess, what, um, you mentioned that it took a while to kind of get the, the, uh, the franchises up and running and in order and, and what did it, like, was the, you know, one of the things I want to find out is like, did the mayoral race and the outcome of the mayoral race, is that going to affect your, you know, I, I feel like you mentioned on previous occasions that the Bloomberg administration was particularly excited about projects like this. Um, do yes, you anticipate yes. a change in that with the new administration? Are you concerned about that, or or is it mostly just that you know you know he was excited? I'm sure projects under him will continue. It just yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think the current administration from Bloomberg, um, you know, they're very uh, tech savvy and they understand uh, that it, technology and infrastructure are very critical for the city to succeed, especially into the future. As um, you know, they want to make New York City a tech hub. Um, but the new administration, I would feel that they would want to keep the same policies or expand them. You know, I can't imagine anyone who would want to retract from those policies because clearly tech, tech companies and, and the supporting um, industry around them, they're definitely helping the city grow, especially its tax base, because one of the issues with the city is, you know, they're, um, the tax base from the financial industry and other legacy industries, they're on the decline, and so the city has to figure out where the shortfall, how they're going to cover that shortfall, so to speak. So. Um, again, you can see tech companies moving to the city, and they're definitely taking up huge amounts of real estate here just in Manhattan alone. So if you look at, for example, a section of Manhattan Park Avenue South, uh, in particular, or the Grumman District, typically, you know, these are older buildings. They don't have, you know, the proper infrastructure in them. And they've always had difficulty, um, let's say, uh, they had a huge vacancy rate at, at low, low cost per square foot. With the tech companies moving into the city, you know, those rents are some of the most expensive now, you know, compared to midtown Manhattan, which is just insane. And it's really the community driving that, that real estate you know, up. So, um, anyway, that's one interesting aspect of what, you know, the tech community is doing here in the New York City real estate market and the economy. Uh, sure, just before we jump to the next question, I just want to say for anybody watching, if they want to uh, add any, any questions onto our Google Plus page, uh, we will try to get to them during this conversation. And I guess I want to just get from, that's what the administration and the, and the local government's view was for uh, technology and bringing IT into the, uh, into the city. How has been, what's been the business response uh, in New York City knowing that there is a fiber build-out uh, coming? Well, I think uh, the, the local city agencies, uh, when they hear about... Um, for example, us as a new franchisee starting to do this, they're all very excited, very receptive, and they've been actually quite helpful in terms of helping us, uh, you know, get the information or helping us search through some of the red tape, um, so to speak, in order to get what we need to get done, you know. Um, so it's been smooth so far, so I'm happy with that, and I'm hoping after the new administration, you know, things will remain the same way. Um, but in general, you know, um, they've been very um, pleasing to work with, actually. That's what great. is the what are the capabilities and the and the possibilities of what you're offering? So you're offering fiber, enterprise fiber, and what are the what are the possibilities of each fiber strand of each cable? How much uh, data are we talking about? So yes, uh, so the network that we're building, um, basically, we're building um, the main backbone's uh, 432 count fiber, um, you know, cable. It's a not that big, maybe slightly less than an inch and a half in diameter. And we're running these up and down avenues, and then we're running smaller cables, like 144-account cables that go east to west. Um, and this network, each fiber uh, pair is able to support literally hundreds of wavelengths. Uh, but we typically right now, so let me back up a bit. So the services that we're offering over this fiber is basically ultra-fast internet access, 100 megabit, gigabit ethernet, 10 gigabit, or even up to 100 gigabit per second. And we have a very unique architecture and delivery mechanism to be able to bring that cost of delivery of the Internet access down very substantially. 
uh, very competitive um, compared to what you know the existing carriers have to offer here in New York City. And that's the way we design is basically is a completely passive platonic core. So in essence, we're running dark fiber into the buildings, and if we have a passive unit in the basement of the buildings or somewhere in the building that can basically break up the fiber into multiple wavelengths, you know, eight wavelengths, sixteen wavelengths, and we have the possibility of even designing it to go break it up into 120 wavelengths. And customers attach into those um, channels, you know, those wavelengths, and this this box this that breaks up the the fiber into wavelengths, it doesn't use any electricity. So when there's um, a major event like Sandy, for example, our system can still continue to operate. And if the customer can still power their um, devices you know, in the office, they can actually use our passive photonic connection, which goes back to our pop site in a major car rental, let's say 325 Hudson Street or 60 Hudson Street or 111 8th Avenue, as long as those car rentals have power, which um, we've always had power you know, throughout all these events in the last 20 years, you know, the customer can still get their Internet access service. So anyway, Internet access is one of the services. The second service that we are offering is dark fiber, dark fiber which is this, the service I was mentioning to that we had such great difficulty procuring, you know, cost effectively, systematically, and so forth. So we actually have the standard product offering where an actual hospital or university or any business for that matter can say they can have their own raw fiber optic cable from one building to another building and by providing the raw fiber, it actually allows them to hook up any electronics they want on that fiber and run at any data rate, you know. Um, and we just, you know, they just pay us, you know, for the rental of those fiber pairs, if you will. So those are the two main um, product offerings that we're offering. And what's the, the what's the process of actually installing the fiber underneath the cities of New York? Oh yeah, so we actually have some photos of this um, on our Google Plus page. So if you search for South Vacation and Google Plus. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, I've only seen it a couple times, and even though we've been putting this business plan together, I don't know for how long I could tell you, maybe uh, over 12 years. Um, so, we, so the first time I actually saw how the entire process worked was when we actually hired our own employees to start laying this cable in, and we were there the first night. I was, like, well, I was watching them doing the rotting, roping, and pulling the fiber. So actually, so the way we lay cable in is. Um, they have to basically push a rod underground from in the duct from one manhole to another manhole, block to block. It's such a manual process. So we have a rotter, which is basically a power rod on a truck that shoots out a steel rod into the duct, and we can use um, that type of machine if the duct is empty. Or they'll typically use hand rods, and literally it's just a rod, you know, that they push into the duct. Once it gets to the other end, they will tape a piece of rope pull the rod back, and now you have a rope from one section to another section. And they keep repeating this, you know, until they get them on a, uh, until the rope's on a footage or they get to the destination. And then once the rope is in place, let's say a span of two or three or 4,000 feet, then they'll basically tape the rope or, or we have a, I don't know, it's a, some type of gadget, they hook up a fiber to the rope, and then they'll pull it all the way through all the sections, you know, section by section. And uh, so that's how it is. It's actually a very simple, just a manual process, you know, very labor intense. Um, but from the time we got the franchise in February um, and, and from the time they started hitting the streets in June, we have um, basically cable now uh, from Midtown all the way down to Union Square and in, and in the financial district. So really impressive for such a small crew of four people um, for them to lay that much cable in. and. We're in the process of now uh, getting uh, a couple of our first buildings on that, which is pretty cool. That's excellent. So when you, you mentioned, I mean, just to make sure, because I mean, I'm sure there are people watching who aren't as familiar as perhaps we are with kind of what the what it looks like underneath the streets of New York. Uh, you mentioned, you know, getting cable into the duct. So what are these ducts? You know, what's underneath the, city, the streets that lets you... Oh, let yeah. A little background on that. Um, so uh, back in back in 1891 is when a company called Imperial City and Subway was created, um, and I think it was the mayor at that time who basically ordered the creation of this entity to bury all overhead uh, cabling underground. And this might be actually covered in tubes, you know, in the book actually. So it might be an interesting question for him would put it in, from a historical perspective. But anyway, so some of these ducts are created back from 1891, and um, you know they're made of different types of material. Um, clay, uh, mud type ducts, uh, could be made of wood and so forth. And I would say most recently over the last, uh, let's say, 20 years, some of the newer ducts are made of PVC. So we try to find any ducts, you know, some of the older ducts are much more deeper versus the newer ones which are more closer to the surface, you know, um, when you enter into the manhole. 
Um, and so um, it's very crowded, very congested. You have a lot of copper. Obviously, the, even, the, if, even though the copper may be dead, it's very difficult for Verizon to pull that old copper out because it's literally now part of the conduit. Um, but, you know, uh, and, oh, so all these kids have been accumulating, you know, since the life of these ducks, um, whether it's from 91 or, you know, from 10 years ago or whatnot. Um, and uh, the issue is uh, finding space in the ducks. And even if you find space, um, the major issue that we're finding is some of these ducks are collapsed uh, because, you know, again, uh, the weight of the street or a lot of street resurfacing projects happen or the streets get torn up and we put back together. And so over time, you know, the weight of the street comes down on these ducks and the ducks kind of get pinched. So our rope can get through, and when you rope it, you'll think everything's okay, but when you start pulling your fiber cable through, the fiber won't fit through, you know, because it doesn't have the same properties like the rope, where the rope can kind of squeeze through those bends. So we had great difficulty, especially, let's say, getting through Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue, and we wasted literally a month to a month and a half, you know, on those avenues trying to get our fiber through and ended up finding basically the ducks were in really bad condition. So we ended up having to pull that back out, and we ended up redirecting the cables through 6th Avenue, which was a lot easier. Um, so that means when you go through these coll collapsed ducks, uh, you know, we have to use a lot smaller count cable. Unfortunately, there's no good uh, records that the city has or Empire City uh, has, or at least none that's disclosed to us, of uh, what the conditions of these ducks are you know, throughout the city. So every night is an interesting experience for our guys. So if we have an order... Um, to run fiber into a particular building, you know, we have no idea what the conditions are until we actually do rotting, roping, and pulling fiber. And when the ducts are collapsed, basically we'll end up having to repeat the entire process, but, you know, by rerouting, you know, going through other streets. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, we were trying to run fiber to a building on uh, 49th Street, and we had a splice point on 46th Street, and you would think it's only a couple blocks long just to get the fiber over. But in fact, you know, the ducts were in such bad condition that we had to go back down to 36th Street you know, and then head back west and then go back north. And, you know, it's just a small project turned into a large, larger project. So um, in this business, you never know, you know, what, how, it's, how your actual cables can be ran, you know, just because of these conditions. Yeah. So and what you may need to do ultimately is kind of step in and, uh, or, or maybe Empire City Subway or whatever the entity, entity is and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on on the ground and, who is going to reinforce or reconstruct, you know, the conduits? Because in certain areas, you know, our cables may be the last cables that can get through, and so that isn't a very good position for the city to be in, you know, from a longe longevity perspective. Because the city really needs a lot more providers like Stull um, in here to really make it a more competitive environment. You know, not only competitive pricing, but also competitive service offerings. You know, which is really key to the residents and businesses here in the city. Yeah, I mean, it struck me, like, I, I was talking, you know, I work in media in addition to working on this project, and a couple of the companies that I worked with are paying, you know, $2,000 a month for 4 megabit connection to the Internet um, that's coupled with their phone service, and if they dump the Internet, they lose their phone service, and it's like a whole thing. Um, and uh, so definitely I think New York City's ripe for kind of a competitive internet marketplace, and you would think that, given that it's such a large city, that that would already exist. Um, but it doesn't really. <laughs> Not from a kind of small business to medium-sized business, growing business yeah. perspective, at least. Every day, uh, we're coming across businesses, you know, who um, basically have service from the incumbent carriers, and they're really restricted. And when they hear about what we're doing, they get really excited. Yeah. Um, but I can't believe it's actually been going on for so long. You know. Um, you know, back in the late 90s, I actually wanted to run fiber and gigabit internet access, you know, to the buildings. And fast forwarding, here we are in 2013, 2014 coming about, and we still really don't have cost-effective gigabit internet access. And this is just insane. There's no reason why businesses can't get cost-effective gigabit service. Yeah. What do you so think? Uh, what do you think cities could do, like New York, uh, to promote smaller ISPs or com promote a more competitive marketplace? What would you, what would you suggest to, for those cities to get, to allow gigabyte service into uh, communities that, you know, don't have it? Yeah, I actually had this discussion with, uh, with the Finnish uh, delegates that came into New York City a couple of weeks ago, and my advice for any city, you know, whether here in the United States or abroad, um, in order to really foster true competition, you know, by having multiple ISPs, whether they're small or large, 
um, just like how you have um, um, roads, you know, for cars to move over, you should have, whenever roads are being constructed or maintained, have the city install empty conduits underground that allow very easy access for ISPs just to pull fiber through. So this way, um, you know, none of us really have to cut the street up, dig it, dig it up, or anything like that, because that's really the most expensive or difficult process. So anyway, laying conduits in um, is 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 a number is the first important thing. Second is building conduits also into buildings, because if those, if that's there, then all organizations have to do is really pull fiber through existing conduits that the city owns. Um, and the third thing is make sure the franchise process or the or the rights to utilize the conduits are very cost effective. You know that's the, you know the next uh, piece I would say. But as long as the physical infrastructure is laid in these conduits, then there's no reason for ISPs to come in because you know the cost of fiber and labor is all that's left at the end of the day. That, you know in terms of you know actually pulling fiber through. You know, and obviously not with the standing um, running the network, you know, portion for providing internet connectivity or the telecommunications aspect of the service. But I think the major difficulty, um, again, is getting access, you know, to conduits or making sure they're already pre-built is key for any city. What, um, what is it like with rights of way? Uh, you mentioned, you know, making sure that there's conduit into buildings in addition to conduits under the street. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a problem that you run? I mean, New York has such a kind of range of buildings, age-wise and size-wise. Like, mm -hmm. how how consistent is access to a given basement? You know, when you're trying yeah. to build it. Um, so we would come across, you know, like three types of scenarios. Um, there are some buildings that have no conduits, which is very painful because now you have to construct a conduit. And construct and conduit, conduit in New York City is typically anywhere between 100 and 200 dollars per foot, you know, in terms of construction costs. Mm -hmm. And that cost can get that cost per foot can drop the longer the distance is, you know. But again, nevertheless, you're still looking at anywhere between 20 to 50, 60 thousand dollars typically to build your own conduit from a manhole into a building. Um, so the next scenario is um, aside from constructing a conduit, sometimes there's an existing conduit. Um, and the existing conduits um, we could utilize if they're really old, you know, maybe if it was a conduit built by University of Subway, or, or they could be a private conduit that's owned by another telecommunications company, and so then we have to negotiate with that other telecommunications company or franchisee for the rights to use the conduit, so normally that would involve uh, negotiations, you know, to, like a license fee basically to rent their duck into yeah. the building. Um, but, you know, every building is different, so um, some buildings, actually, we're also finding out now, which is getting common, especially if you look at Rockefeller Center, you know, the building owners actually are building their own conduits, which is really smart, you know, from their basement of the building into the manholes, and they own it, so this way, you know, no one provider can hold that conduit up for, you know, as a hostage, so to speak, you know, because some providers uh, charge a very reasonable rate. For the conduits, some other providers may make it very expensive, like thousands of dollars a month to rent a conduit, which is insane. You might as well go ahead and build it, you know, yourself. Um, so some building owners are getting really smart and savvy about constructing it themselves. So this way, more technical players can go into that common pathway into the building. Cool. And just to, I want to just reiterate, in case it's been a little bit jumbled, like you've brought all these things up, but I'm just going to say them all at once. So in order to offer internet service you know, to build a fiber network like you're doing, you literally need access to the building's basement. You need to you need a hole in the wall of the building's basement that connects to the conduit system underneath New York City, and you need mm -hmm. to physically run a wire from your point of presence through the streets of Manhattan or Queens or the Bronx or Brooklyn or wherever you are building it mm -hmm. uh, into their basement through the conduit system that is, as you mentioned, at times collapsed. Uh, there are no accurate maps often it's full, um, and then... Literally uh, trial and error, I would say, sometimes. Yeah, and it, it just seems to me, like, even if you, you know, you've mentioned that, like, the, the labor of actually installing fiber through the conduit is is not very high in the general scheme of things, but it sounds like, you know, it's still a pretty cost-prohibitive activity. Um, it's going to take a large capital investment right off the bat. Do you think that that prevents other players from getting into the market, and... and to kind of accompany that question, how difficult was it for you to get the franchises that you needed to do this? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
for us, we've been working on this uh, probably for about 12 years, so it was a long time. It, 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 there is a high cost, uh, a barrier to entry, so to speak, in this type of business um, because obviously you have the uh, franchise fees, you know, which in itself is pretty expensive. Um, then you have the cost of the actual construction, which is labor, the materials. In our case, uh, we hired our own construction crew, you know, our own employees. We bought uh, a, a small fleet of trucks. Uh, we had to get a warehouse and the materials and so forth. Uh, but, you know, this was a calculated investment in, in our business plan, so we found that this be the most cost-effective. You know, for us, our strategy was, you know, we wanted to penetrate hundreds of buildings throughout Manhattan. And so the decision was, do we contract it out or do we bring this in-house? And in-house was a lot more cost-effective because, you know, not only cost-effective, but we can also control the delivery and quality aspects of it. And we're really fortunate, actually, because, um, and you met them um, when you were shooting us out in the streets. Yeah. We have a passionate uh, crew, and they love what they do, you know, which is really amazing. And that makes a world of a difference. Um, when you hire contractors, you know, and um, you know, they're great people too, but they don't have the same passion as employees who, who work for us. And uh, what they do, they have a significant impact, not only to our business, but to our customers and the city and its communities you know, that we touch. And, um, and that drives them to work even harder, so to speak, and to go above and beyond, you know, the call. And, if, again, if you just look at the rate of progress and what they've accomplished just in a matter of two, three months in terms of laying cable, that's really impressive, you know, going from basically nothing to trying to figure everything out from scratch, you know. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, uh, with that being set aside, um, in New York City, it's, it is cost prohibitive just because it's New York City. But I think uh, in other cities, um, if they can make the franchise process, uh, you know, if they make the franchise cost lower, so to speak, you know, so that means the barrier to entry is lower, and the ha and they have these conduits, you know, the pre-built infrastructure in place in the streets and from uh, from the streets into the buildings, um, that would limit majority of the construction costs, and that would allow a lot more a lot uh, ISPs of all sizes to come in and compete, you know, uh, for providing services. Well, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> well, well, now I'm curious. How many miles of cable have are you have you laid, and how many more miles do you have to go? Well, well, this is a not because this is a process that's going to be never ending. You know, uh, uh -huh. even in Manhattan. So right now we just laid cable. Um, our main um, main trunk cables run along um, what's it, um, Sixth Avenue, Avenue of the Americas. And next year, you know, we want to get another route on the west side and east side of Manhattan. So we'll have three main backbone cables. To, you know, that run. Uh, north to south across Manhattan. Um, but it's going to be miles and miles of cable. I don't know how many miles of cable we'll run, but, you know, we're doing, you know, I, I guess we're late. I mean, we're buying enough inventory to get the job done, make sure, you know, we meet our numbers. Again, we're a small company, so right now my wife and I self finance this entire operation. Um, so, you know, we, we're taking it step by step. Um, I, I don't know how much, um, what we actually laid in. I just know we have, again, a chunk of cable basically from... Uh, midtown all the way down to Union Square, um, and then a chunk down in the financial district, and we should have the gap, the remaining gap, completed off maybe by year end or by January next year. So that'll be at least four or five miles worth of cable, I think, we'll have in the ground uh, easily, maybe even more, because obviously we have cables going out to buildings and so forth. Um, and, you know, as the business scales, this will probably get a lot larger. We have ambitions to get our fiber across into Queens and Brooklyn, um, and eventually into Sun Island, you know, which is what we're hopefully working for in the next year or two. And how much data can pass through the through the cable backbone versus a light wave versus a single strand? Oh yeah, no, it's a, it's a, actually we control that really. You know, once you have the raw fiber, it's all about the electronics that you place on the fiber. So uh, right now, the current technology, commercial available technology that we can get on our hands, allows us to run 100 gigabits per second per wavelength. And today we use what's called CWM wavelengths. We, they're very cost effective. So CWM wavelengths allows us to provision 16 wavelengths per fiber pair. And we can also switch into DWM wavelengths. The component costs are a little bit higher, actually a lot higher. And that allows us to get into 128 wavelengths or even higher than that. So if you just do the math, you know, it's massive in terms of, you know, the amount of data that you can pass. So, so uh, on the current systems that we have, we can pass 100 gigabits times 16. Per, per fiber pair. 
fiber pair. Correct, for a fiber pair. And use how much? What's the count on the fiber? Amount of like maybe a, a sixteen hundred gigabits per second per fiber pair today. And then what's the uh, so one point six terabytes per second essentially? Correct. Yeah. There and what's the count on the pair that you're running in the trunk line? Oh, four hundred thirty-two fibers. <laughs> so it's it's seven hundred terabytes. That's amazing, right? Yeah. Like a, T, a T1 connection was a big deal in the 90s. I remember when, when we started the business, our, we bought our first T1 from MCI for $3,000 per month, which is insane. Today we sell a gigabit for just under $2,000 a month. So yeah. it tells you how far we've come along. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, I guess, my uh, a follow-up question. You know, most consumers in, the, in, the, in New York City, uh, at least that I know of, are paying... You know, for for consumer internet again, this isn't business, but they're paying roughly in the neighborhood of like fifty, you know, thirty to fifty dollars a month for a ten to thirty megabit megabyte connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, do you feel like consumer offerings are in the future for you guys as well, or are you mostly focusing on enterprise or small business? I guess what what's your target market? Yeah, you know, let, me, let me just let me just jump in just for a second. Michael's talking about 10 to 30 megabytes down and half yeah. to one megabyte up. Right. So, when, I the <laughs> so, yeah, what, what, so how is that? To, how is the down versus up just uh, differentiate from what you're from what from what Stealth will be offering? Oh yeah, we're offering symmetric capacity. It it, it makes no sense why you would have more down versus less up. It's almost like they want to artificially constrain your your creativity on the internet. I have no idea. <laughs> Because really, you need the upload speed in order to contribute back to the internet. If you think about it, I mean, I'm lucky to even be able to do this video call, you know, because I, I'm in a similar situation where I have this product from some company, and I have a lot of speed down, but very little up. And uh, and uh, anyway, I'm happy that it even works for that way because I have no other choice in this area of Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, but uh, so today, still services businesses, small businesses to large businesses. Um, you know, we service again a wide range of companies. Um, our smallest product right now is 100 megabits, you know, which is around 800 bucks a month. So we can, it's, it's not really affordable by the small business, really, really small businesses, you know, who want to spend really typically two to three hundred dollars per month. But I think as we continue to build our business and get scaled, we want to figure out how we can service the really small businesses, you know, with a really truly competitive, ultra fast type of internet product that provides symmetrical capacity. Um, and so again, it's just a matter of getting to the economics. You know, again, we're a small company, so we have to, um, you know, figure out where we're, where we can service. Um, I, I guess where we can provide the best value, you know, yeah. for the limited staff and the limited um, resources that we have. Uh, because to service smaller businesses in the residential, um, it's a lot more time consuming. We need to build up a larger staff in order to handle that. Then sure. we need a lot more crews, if you will, uh -huh. to handle the installation. So. It's a, a lot. It's a much more complex organization that we need to contract, uh, construct, if you will, uh, to get to that stage. So I think eventually, you know, uh, that's something that we are very curious to take a look at, because once we have these fibers in the streets, there's no real reason for us to technically not bring fibers into a residential building, uh, and then install these filters so each, you know, residential unit can get their own fibers. You know, have fully symmetric inner capacity. The real issue really comes down to is. How do we handle that customer care and technical support? You know, the whole technical support aspect because really that's one of the major cost uh, centers for us um, sure. for dealing with the consumers. And then obviously we need to uh, get the price points down a lot. So that means we also have to adjust our economics. So that means we need to get to a larger scale in terms right. of uh, getting larger volumes of traffic, uh, negotiating uh, probably better costs on our components, so to speak. Um, and we'll have to see uh, if we could realistically provide gigabit. Symmetrical gigabit internet access at let's say eighty dollars a month, comparable to Google Fiber. Um, you know, because uh, still you have a lot of operating costs on the back end. So it's interesting to see how Google Fiber is able to whether it's really a share. Even though it's symmetrical gigabit internet access that they're provisioning to the customer, do they really get that on the back end? I'm sure there has to be some sort of load factor um, in order to get it down there. Because still the raw bandwidth costs, you know, aren't really there at this time to make money at eighty dollars a month. You know, to provide truly, truly guaranteed. And then there's access. So there has to be some sort of low factor, maybe 10 to 1 or, or 20 to 1. But when you're running at gigabit type speed, you know, um, you know to, the, to, to the home, um, then the backend infrastructure has to be 100 gigabits or more. So when you do the load factors, you're fine. You, know, you can play with those numbers. Right. Okay.
Now, do you guys also offer? Because I know, like I've, I work for a variety of different small businesses, and one of the things that they've mentioned to me is that you know they'd love to drop their internet service through their their telecom provider, but that ultimately, when that happens, the rate for the actual telco service goes sky high. Do you guys also offer telco service? And is that you know I guess these things like lockup contracts and the kind of you know peop, the way that the marketplace has been structured. Uh, at least a lot of the U.S. is you have these sort of people are offering tiers of service, and if you try to scale back your tier and switch part of your service to another provider, the rate for the next tier is higher or just as high as mm -hmm. what you were previously paying for. Um, it's you know it's a comp competition practice, and is that something that you guys have run into? And if so, like are you you know do you also offer phone service? Are you offering information services in addition to Teleco services to kind of make sure you can compete in that environment, or is it something that hasn't really come up yet? It hasn't come up yet because, uh, again, we're selling only to businesses. Um, uh -huh. Really, two, two or three main products, which is really the internet dedicated internet access, dark fiber, and maybe transport services. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it, you know VoIP has come up a lot, you know, with inquiries. But you know, we work with a couple partners who are really specialized in in that particular field in terms sure. of providing hosted or cloud-based uh, PBX services. So we've been referring, you know, those clients to um, these organizations ever um, since they're specialized. Um, and we don't offer TV, but let's say we got into the residential business. That is an issue because that means, um, you know, residential customers, they love the Internet, but they do need... Phones may not be that big of a deal, but they want TV. And so, you know, how do we do TV? And uh, hopefully, you know, there's competition on the internet. Maybe YouTube will get into the TV business. Who knows? But but you get the idea. Once that happens, then I think people will just care for only internet access, and they'll buy over-the-top services from providers. You know, whether it's telephone service or or video on demand service. You know, obviously like Netflix, or maybe they'll get their live TV programming from Aereo, which is a broken-based company. Yeah. Uh, if you follow what they're doing, that's pretty cool. Taking over-the-air uh, TV signals and allocating a, a micro antenna per subscriber and then streaming it, streaming it out to the internet. So that might be an interesting uh, alternative. Yeah, Aereo is really cool. It's one of my favorite small businesses that I've heard about. The kind of innovative approach they're taking to, to back-end mm -hmm. the licensing agreements with, uh, with the major networks. And, you know, it seems like from what we've kind of come to understand about TV in particular is that, you know, live sports are the biggest barrier to kind of all online all the time television services, um, just because the major networks have pretty solid contracts with the NFL and the MLB and the NBA, and, and when that changes, I think we'll see a lot more options for online viewing, um, and I think everybody knows that, so it's sort of a, an interesting, you know, who will blink first, the, uh, the NFL or CBS kind of situation. Um, but, yeah, the, I guess, you know, to kind of get at some of these other, you know, what do you guys perceive to be your biggest challenge moving forward? Is it just getting, continuing to slog at the same thing that you've been doing, or do you envision new challenges? Like, what do you think is coming? Um, challenges. Um, I mean, the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is um, we have customers, you know, throughout the city that want, you know, uh, fiber connect, internet fiber connectivity. They want to get away from the legacy um, technologies like Ethernet or copper or cable technology, whatever it might be. So, but in order for us to bring fiber into the building, um, assuming that the condo is already there, uh, one of the new challenge hurdles, and, they, and this is not a new hurdle, so to speak, in our industry, is really um, landlords uh, not being receptive to allowing new new fiber carriers to come in. And I think this probably has to do with during the 2000 time when there was a flood of telecommunication carriers coming into the business. They were uh -huh. throwing money left and right, you know, to these property managers and or the owners of these buildings, and so they basically, in essence, have their hand out, so to speak. You know, wh you know, what what are we going to pay them uh, as a license fee um, to compensate them for it? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't come for it because it is really the fair property, but some of these fees are just so um, out of this world that we really can't even begin to even entertain that. And so it's really unfortunate because the tenants in those buildings won't be able to have access to competitive service offerings. Um, so we need to educate them that internet access is not a luxury, it's a commodity just like water and electricity and you need to have it. And not all um, connectivity or telecommunication services are all equal. Everyone has different flavors of it, if you will. 
Um, so, you know, that's a challenge. It's more of an edu educational challenge, you know, so they need to kind of look at us differently. And I think they will ultimately figure this out because, let's say, if New York City, well, I would say all businesses are rolling internet connection, and then every year that's getting more and more important. And ultimately it's going to get to the point where if businesses don't get the connectivity that they need, they're going to have to move to another building, you know, even if it's across the street to get fiber. Once that happens, that's going to be the wake up call. But of course, I'm trying to figure out how to fast forward that so we can educate them today versus sometime down the road. Um, so that's a, one of the current interesting challenges that we have, I would say. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to just kind of reiterate that for the sake of, of you know, the layman. So you literally have to negotiate right-of-way access with every single landlord that you, for every tenant that you deal with. Right? I mean, that's ultimately what every, about Exactly. Here. Every building. It's the same story all over again. Who we are, what we want to do, then the discussion gets in conversation, what type of work do we want to do. And most telecommunication carriers have equipment that they place in the basement of the buildings that require space, and, you know, a lot of space, like a whole cabinet sometimes, or half a cabinet, and it requires power. In our setup, we have a small little box that uses no electricity. It's a small fiber cable that gets in, and a bunch of small fiber cables will go out to each tenant in the building that wants service. And but even something small like that, you know, it, it's such an interesting hurdle, you know. But yeah. um, it takes time, and we're you know we're getting over those hurdles one by one. But it gets you know, but to keep repeating it over and over again, it's such a hassle. <laughs> you just yeah. wish, that after you've done let's say 16 of them, you would assume the rest should be easy. But no, it's the same process over and over. So how would a business in Manhattan looking for fiber connection get in, uh, get in touch with Stealth and uh, get access to uh, your network? Oh, yeah. Uh, I would um, just visit www.stealth.net, and uh, they can give us a call or email us at info at stealth.net and uh, let us know where they're in the city and uh, what we can do to help them. And um, either me or someone from our team will be happy to uh, yeah, speak to them. Have you? I'm just curious, and you know, if you're if you're not, you know, when you run into difficulty with landlords, have you gone to tenants and said, "Hey, we're prepared to offer this service for this price, but we can't get access to your building"? You know, is that something? Yeah, that's we've done that, and um, and that and, and that helps only if the tenant is is in the process of negotiating, or they're moving in, or there might be a substantial tenant in the building. Yeah, usually that helps a lot. But if they're an existing tenant there for a quite a long time, uh, we've nice. seen two cases where um, you know not really got budged, and the tenant obviously knows what the situation is because we're really transparent to things like this. Yeah, and um, and we usually leave it up to them or their broker to try to figure out what to do next. Yeah, it's an interesting. It, it, to me, it seems like a really exciting time then to be a developer in the city because there. Are, you know, for commercial real estate at least, there are a lot of opportunities to really make your building competitive in a way that a lot, a lot aren't if you're building a new building or renovating an old building. Um, I would say even an old building, you know, a lot of these tech companies, they love the old architecture or the old construction of the buildings, you know, that brick, that yeah. raw feel. The only thing they're lacking is just fiber in those buildings. So, you know, they can give any of us a call, so to speak, and as long as they get the fiber in there, they'll, they'll be a magnet for all high-tech companies. High-tech companies, all they really need is nice-looking, you know, space that's clean and uh, yeah. and fiber, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> and it. electricity and running and water. Electricity. But that, that's mandated by the city. They have to have electricity and water. <laughs> right? <laughs> they're going to be, if they're going to be a commercial commercial uh, zone. But, no, it's really, it's exciting. What you're doing, see, to me, is really exciting. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, as someone who, like I said, I work in media in New York City and we pass all kinds of data back and forth. I would say we're probably one of the higher, you know, us in like sort of database, you know, really intensive data-driven stuff is probably the most intense users of bandwidth that I can think of in finance. Um, and, you know, we're always looking for more. You know, every, every company that I've been to wants more internet. They want faster internet. They want to be able to push dailies across. They want to be able to push, you know, huge pieces of media back and forth and and being able to do that really changes the game for them because it prevent it means that they don't have to be locked to New York City uh, facilities, but they can operate elsewhere as well. And so it's, yeah. it's exactly. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, we've been doing it now almost for 18 years in terms of providing internet connectivity. So when we started laying the fiber out, we love it because it's basically dark fiber that we're provisioning to all these buildings. And since the core of the network is completely passive photonics, you know, no electronics at the actual um, office buildings, mm -hmm. uh, we sh you know, so it's fiber straight to the customer, and we ship them a small laser. And that laser is what dictates, you know, what the link speeds are, whether it's 1 gig, 10 gigabit, or, or 100 gigabit. And if new technology comes out, we simply just change those lasers out, which is yeah. kind of fun. And then everything is up and running. So it's not like an overhaul. There's no major overhaul in our network at all, which is nice. Yeah, so you can upgrade service without really having to. You don't. You certainly don't have to pull out, pull anything out, and put it back in. It's just a matter of. No, it's not like a massive upgrade, you know, in our core, so to speak. Because the core is really just dumb, completely uh, passive. It's just routing pure light, and the intelligence is really at the edge, you know, of the fibers. So it's a very simplistic design, but it's, it's designed just in mind for delivering ultra fast internet access. And, you know, our goal right now is really try to push the envelope, you know, try to get that price down as far as we can as we continue to get scale here in the city. Yeah. So hopefully it'll shake things up and uh, make it a more interesting, competitive environment. That's what we're really looking forward to. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I'm looking forward to that, too. I, I, hope it's just, I hope it happens. Okay. So um, do you guys have any other questions, any other, uh, any other comments? Um, you know, I, I guess my only real, you know, we covered all the big stuff. No, I think, you know, this has been really interesting for me. Yeah. You know, I know it's been a bit, a bit technical and we tried to kind of make sure we can, we can communicate it clearly, but, uh, this was really great. It, it's exciting to hear how far you've gone. I mean, we, when we shadowed along with you, it was over on 38th and Madison, and I think it was right at the beginning of kind of what you, you mentioned is your, your routing issues as they started yeah. to crop um, so yeah, really you were crazy. filming, I think uh, that's where we got stuck, and we had, like, what, 2,000 or 5,000 feet of cable on the street? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we have all those photos, really. Um, and <laughs> and uh, it's, so it's really exciting to hear how far you've managed to come and to, to hear about kind of your plan to push it further. Um, you know, that's, that's really exciting. So we're glad, glad that you were able to kind of overcome that, that barrier, and we're excited to see what happens next. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I think one of the things that you guys like to talk about is that a lot of folks don't know that there's actually this physical infrastructure behind the Internet. I mean, I think a lot of folks, yeah. and, and for, for good reason, think, hey, it just kind of magically appears on your computer sort of thing. So it's good to know that that there is that physical, physical infrastructure that's really important. Somehow. Yeah? Yeah. And, and it's really important to me to, like, impress on people the, the amount of sheer physical labor that has to go into this. I mean, you're talking about routing problems. You're not talking about, like, a computer screen. You're talking about like walking the streets and like pulling a rope through and making sure that yeah, you have you're in the manhole and you're yeah. looking east, west, north, south, and you see all these ducks. And yeah. uh, the ducks that you see in the north may not necessarily go north; it may twist and turn to another direction. So it's just amazing, you know, the amount of trial and error, so to speak, to figure out how the ducks are at it. I mean, in so, it, it, for the most part, now we have some maps, but there's a lot of undocumented ducks, you know, that are not shown on the map, which is interesting. So. Um, but when you get down there, it is so chaotic. So uh, yeah, but it's still amazing to see how, how our crew uh, does this every night, and uh, but they get the work accomplished. Um, and I guess it's kind of an art in and itself. Yeah, and I mean, how important was hiring like the right crew? That this isn't something that anybody could do. They have to have a certain familiarity with the city and. Exactly. Yeah, you. It's a. It's something you only learn from the trade. You know, from uh, from what I hear from our crew. And uh, I would say I'm really lucky, you know, that we were able to find, uh, you know, um, our employees, you know, the talent. Um, and I think the first two people were key to it, you know, uh, Brendan and Dave, who run the crew. And from there, they were able to pull the rest of the crew, um, you know, fill in the rest of the positions. But um, but finding the right people with passion, you know, that's self-driven and motivated and know and does whatever it takes to get the job done, that's really key, especially here in the city. Again, if everything was laid out very systematically, let's say you're doing a completely greenfield installation where there's already ducks laid in, and it's nice and neat and sort of speak, I would say it's really easy then. Anyone can get trained on the spot, but New York City is a completely different animal. You've got to get trained from people that were trained, you know, from other people who worked in this field and so on. So I have a feeling it's just, you know, knowledge has been passing down and down and down. So. 
Yeah. But I don't think there's any school in, in the U.S. or anywhere, really, that trains anyone from this. It's something you just have to get in and learn yourself if you're given the opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Well, Srihari, thank you so much. Uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> this is a great conversation. Really appreciate it. And want to let our viewers know that um, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag NetRights. And want to remind everybody that our next Google Hangout uh, will be on the 19th uh, with author and journalist Andrew Blum, author of Journey to, or Tube's Journey to the Center of the Internet. And that will take place at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 10.30 Pacific Time. And uh, again, want to thank all all of our guests and uh, participants for joining us today. It was a great conversation. Great. Thank you for having me. Okay. Great. Thanks so much for coming, Shirari. This was really great. Yeah. Thank you, Shirari. Thank you. Okay. And that's right. going to wrap up our broadcast for today. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Yeah.